In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In this month of October, the Church recommends to the faithful, once again, the prayer of the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Among the many merits of this prayer is the fact that it is some uh, summation of the central mysteries of our salvation. And I would like to explain to you today how that is. In the joyous mysteries of the Holy Rosary, we contemplate the joy of having Christ with us. He is our Emmanuel, which means God with us. What a consolation this is. What is more joyful than Christmas Day And why is it joyful except that God has come to us in a little baby in Bethlehem? God with us begins at the Annunciation, which is the first mystery of the joyful mysteries, which is the incarnation of God in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then we see the joy of Elizabeth as she greets the mother of God. She calls her the mother of my Lord. How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Let the Protestants pay attention to that, the mother of my Lord. So she rejoices to see the mother of God but even more, the infant John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth leaps for joy at the presence of Christ in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary because it is God with us. In the third mystery, we experience the joy of the shepherds who see the Christ child, the angels, the Magi, to whom was revealed the mystery of the incarnation of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. It is Christmas Day. In the fourth mystery, we see the joy of Simeon and Anna, who were very pious people in the temple. And when our our Blessed Lord, our Blessed Lady with St. Joseph brought the Christ child to be presented in the temple. They saw him and and both he, Simeon and Anna, were very joyful to see the Christ child and to hold him because it was God with us. He has finally come. And Simeon said that he was told by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And he was filled with joy. And then in the fifth mystery, we behold the devastation in the hearts of Mary and Joseph because they are separated from the presence of Christ. They are separated from God with us. Only to be consoled by being with him again in the temple after three days. And this is the joy of God with us. So those mysteries concern our Lord's presence upon earth among us. Our blessed Lord, however, did not come simply to be among us on this mortal earth, this this earth of sin, disease, and death. St. Paul said, a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. St. Augustine said, Christ has no cause for coming into the world except to save sinners. Take away the sick, take away the injured, and you have no need for medicine. If the great physician came from heaven, it is because there was a great sick man who was lying here on earth And this sick man is the human race. So God came to earth 
in order to draw us to himself. Not that we draw him to ourselves, but that he draw us to himself. He came as our Emmanuel, that is, God with us, in order that we be with God. He came to join us to himself in his mystical body, the Holy Catholic Church. And through faith, communion, contrition for sin, the sacraments, actual grace and sanctifying grace, and the love of God to rise from the dead one day and to ascend into heaven just as he did in our Blessed Lady and there to remain forever in the presence of the beatific vision. This is what he has in mind. The complete restoration of the human race to what they were meant to be before the fall. But there is a tremendous chasm between us and that restoration. There is the tremendous pit of sin. So while we would rejoice at seeing our Lord among us, we cannot be with him. He cannot draw us to himself unless he breaks those chains of sin. And this comes at a very high price. So just as the immediate purpose of the incarnation is God with us, the ultimate purpose of the incarnation is we with God. This being so, and understanding the price that had to be paid, we pass into the sorrowful mysteries of the Holy Rosary, where our Lord pays the price for our sins in order to detach us from the thraldom of Satan and attach us to himself as our shepherd and king. For there was an immovable obstacle to our being with God, immovable except by the omnipotence of God himself. For even if every single human being offered up himself the way our Lord did and suffered the tortures and death of our blessed Lord, that would not have been enough to solve the problem that would not have paid the price because God is infinite and the offense against him was therefore infinite. It had to be done by someone who was both man and God, capable of an infinite reparation, yet capable of sacrifice. And that was our blessed Lord. So heavy and so dense was this obstacle of sin that in order to pay the price which justice demanded, God himself had to move this obstacle by the price of his passion and death. This sacrifice of his body and blood on the hill of Calvary affects the release from the power of sin. What is the worst thing that can happen to you except to fall into mortal sin? For mortal sin will detach you from God forever and will condemn you to hell forever. It is the worst possible thing that could happen to you, a single mortal sin. Yet by the blood of Christ, it is the easiest problem to solve. For even by an act of perfect contrition, an interior act of perfect contrition, whereby you are sorry for having offended the goodness of God, 
The sin is already destroyed. Already. You are back in the state of sanctifying grace. Already. You must confess and have the intention to confess. But see how easy it is to solve the worst problem that you could possibly have. And that problem is so bad that if Christ had not come and released us from the power of sin, we would be in the same position as someone falling into a well that is unable to get out, condemned to die in it, unless someone pulled us out. (coughs) It is our blessed Lord who pulls us out. For we have no ability in ourselves to repent of mortal sin. It is only and always by the grace of God that we receive that willingness to repent. So, in the first mystery, we (coughs) contemplate (coughs) our Lord's agony in the garden, which is, we might say, the offertory of the holy sacrifice of Calvary, where he willingly gave himself up as a victim for sin. In a certain way, that was the most important aspect of it, in a certain way because that offering of himself as a victim gave value to all of the sufferings that he went through. If he had been unwilling, those sufferings would have had no value. So the priest in the Mass offers in the offertory the body and blood of Christ as it will be a victim in the consecration of the Mass. So the the agony in the garden was, in a way, the offertory of the Mass, the Mass of Calvary. And then we see in the other mysteries the tortures of Christ, the scourging, the crowning of thorns, the carrying of the cross, and finally his death on the cross. And we contemplate these horrors of his passion Horror for our Lord indeed, but for us a cleansing labor, a wash, a release from the dominion of Satan and sin, the paying of a great price that we ourselves could never pay. Finally, in the glorious mysteries, we celebrate our union and our attachment to our blessed Lord, our Redeemer. This is the victory of the cross that he is taking us to himself. It is we with God now. He is going to draw us to himself. He has lifted that obstacle. By rising from the dead, he gives us resurrection from the dead. By ascending to heaven, he promises our future ascension into heaven, body and soul, just as our Blessed Lady went. And for us at the end of the world, in the third mystery, we celebrate the means which he gives for this joyful and glorious transformation of our lives, namely the gift of the Holy Ghost, who in the New Testament will take over, we might say, the work of Christ. Christ provided all the means. The Holy Ghost will apply the means to our souls. It is one thing to have a medicine. It is another thing to take it. So the Holy Ghost will bring us sanctifying grace, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, the infused moral virtues that perfect us in the Christian life, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, whereby we are moved by the third person of the Blessed Trinity to good acts every day. So the third person of the Blessed Trinity grants to us an entire spiritual organism, just as your body is an organism. 
So also the Holy Ghost gives to, to us a spiritual organism, that is a, 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 an ability to posit acts which are meritorious, good acts in the state of grace, which are meritorious before God's throne and which merit for us eternal salvation. That's what we receive in that third mystery. Then in the fourth mystery, we see Our Lady, who is the archetype, that is the model of redeemed man, being transported to heaven in anticipation of the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Finally, we see her crowned in glory, which gives us the hope of our future glory in, in heaven in recompense for the many crosses which we have generously borne in this life. That's the Holy Rosary. That's the Catholic faith. The whole Catholic faith is in it. So our blessed Lord, in his infinite wisdom, has given us, in this life, in the Holy Eucharist, both God with us and we with God. Only divine wisdom could figure out how to do that, that he would be with us, but at the same time draw us to himself. On the one hand, we have the consolation of possessing him even on this earth of death, this valley of tears, by having his abiding presence in our tabernacles. What a consolation it, it is in this sick and weird world that gets sicker and weirder every day, that there is in our tabernacles, thanks to the priesthood, which also comes from the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a consolation that is, that he never changes and everything about him is forever. And that he promises us all of these good things and gives us the inspiration to bear persecution for his name's sake. What a consolation that is. But at the same time, because he has placed himself under the humble species of bread and wine. He, in a most marvelous way, also draws us to himself. St. Thomas Aquinas points out that when we eat ordinary food, we assimilate the food to ourselves. It becomes us. But, he says, that the opposite is true when we receive our blessed Lord in the Holy Eucharist. He assimilates us to himself. We become part of him in a way. We become part of his mystical body, which is his holy Catholic Church. We are united to him in a, an intimate way. He comes into us and he takes us to himself. It is a beautiful union of man and God and we are with God. And St. Thomas says the reason that it is true is because he is superior to us. We do not take him to ourselves, but because he is superior to us, he draws us to himself. And it is for this reason that we are participants in the mystical body of Christ by Holy Communion that the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of the unity of the church. And likewise, because it is the sacrament of the unity of the church, it is a grave sacrilege to give the Holy Eucharist to non-Catholics. You must be Catholic in order to receive the Holy Eucharist. The church says that the best way to say the rosary is by contemplating the mysteries that we are reciting.
The rosary, as we have shown, is the summary of the entire Christian life, the law of our daily lives, everything we live for and everything that we hope for. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.